The second half of the lectures on streams is about mostly about flooding. So here is a quotation, in the world there is nothing more submissive and meek than water, yet for attacking that which is hard and strong nothing can surpass it. Floods can be very devastating. I'm going to go back. Here is a link that you'll want to click on in the PowerPoint lecture uh, that is a, just an intro to flash flooding. Here is a look at what can happen during a flood. All of these homes were picked up by the floodwaters, crashed into the bridge. So the bridge may um, have not sustained any damage, but because of the buildings ramming into it, it did sustain damage. Just one of the things that shows you that items in the floodplain can become a problem. Not only can those items get damaged, so the houses were destroyed, but then the stuff in the floodplain can then be spread about the floodplain, causing pollution. Look at all these barrels interspersed between the homes. And, so, and the homes themselves become a part of the pollution problem. Okay. This is an image on the top left here of Boss Castle. Boss Castle is a quaint little village on the coastline in England. And it's a, it's a tourist attraction because it's so beautiful. It, though, became a scene of really devastating flooding in 2004. Move my face out of the way. So click on this link and watch some of it. They rescued people with um, these helicopters. It was the largest rescue mission done outside of wartime in England. And so they brought in helicopters to get the people from were trapped in the building. It's right by the coastline. We don't really see the beach in these images, but it washed 50 cars down into the ocean and really messed up the village. Okay, so click that link and watch the video of the water flowing through the village. All right, floodwaters. Whoop! Floods are naturally occurring events, right? It rains, the channel fills up, the water leaves the channel. They happen when uh, there's too much rain. Um, the soil pore spaces are um, sometimes already full of water, so the ground can no longer absorb more water. Um, maybe they occur because it happens so fast, so sometimes snow melt can um, Accumulate over the winter in the spring. There'll be a warm sunny day and it'll be an all of a sudden event that the water um, The snow melts and then the water rushes down into a valley and Then there can be dam breaks. So throughout history There are some notable dams that have broken over time and those have caused man-made floods the Long Lake flood in the Rocky Mountain National Park occurred in 1982. There was a lake high in the mountains, like a six mile hike. And they, in the 1800s, had improved the dam so it was no longer like a natural lake. It was now a man-made lake. They doubled the size of the lake and uh, made an artificial dam. In uh, 1982, that dam failed, and when it failed, the water rushed down a ravine and um, into a campground, into another stream that then, where was I? Down another stream and hit another dam that failed, and then the waters poured into Estes Park. And um, it was pretty devastating. A couple of people lost their lives in the campgrounds. And there was an alluvial fan that formed at the mouth of the of the gorge. So there are big boulders that were deposited these into the campground. So you can still see, <clears throat> thirty some years later, the scar and the deposit from that big flood. Okay, floods make floodplains. So floodplains are created by flooding activity. This um, cartoon of a floodplain here shows some of the main features. You have a, um, a area of highlands that um, abut the floodplain. This brown in here then is the whole of the floodplain. 
within the sediments of the floodplain. You've got um, three different sediments here. Slope, colluvium, that is what's coming off the edges of the, um, the bank here. You have overbank deposits, that is floodwater deposits, so finer grain sediment. And then these channel deposits in the lighter brown are going to be coarser grain deposits. So those are all going to be interwoven with each other. So the floodplain, oops, accretes vertically and horizontally. So the vertical deposits are the overbank deposits. The lateral deposits are going to be those channel deposits where there's um, deposits mostly of the point bar, the point bar sediments. Okay, there'll be natural levees adjacent to the stream channel, paral paralleling the stream channel. These meander scrolls are just marks where um, the point bars were. Here's the point bar, the cut banks on the outside of the meanders, and of course the oxbow lake and the back swamp or the wetlands adjacent to the stream channel. Okay, so this is showing what happens over time. Here's the original floodplain and then um, if as the landscape um, uplifts then the channel is going to um, erode down into the floodplain and leaving uh, these terraces. So uh, the channel gets deeper. On the edges there will be these um, channel or floodplain terraces. Okay, so in the image here on the bottom left is what it looks like when uh, the floodwaters leave the channel. So there's a trace of the meanders here. I'll outline those. And the trace of the meanders are highlighted by the trees on the edges of the channel. And those are the, um, that's the riparian buffer zone or the vegetated corridor next to the channel. We'll talk more about the riparian buffer zone in a bit. Here on the right is a braided stream. So we talked about different um, patterns with channels, the meandering and the braided. This braided stream is in an area with lots of sediment. And so the stream is, um, weaving its way through these um, braided sediments. Okay, so again, they're a natural part of the stream system. Water is um, temporarily stored in the floodplain. <clears throat> so the, the benefit of that is that um, the floodwaters are spread out over the floodplain. When we decide to live in the floodplain, it's a gamble, right? So we're, we are saying, you know, I, I know this is a flat, fertile area, but I'm going to live here anyway. And so we need to realize that uh, living in the floodplain is sometimes risky. One way to reduce that risk is by building levees. So here is... Uh, levee in New Orleans that failed during Hurricane Katrina and the levee on either side of the river here's the one on this side and then the one on this side the one on the right side did not fail so the house homes to the right did not flood the levee on the left side did fail and because it was so much water in that channel the flooding was way worse the discharge builds um, to a much higher dangerous level when we have these man-made levees and they fail. What happened in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina is the levee failed. When the water got behind the levee, they couldn't get it out. And they had pumps, but the pumps were flooded, and so they, they were um, not able to get the water out from behind the levee. Why do we live in floodplains then? What would be the benefit of living in a floodplain. Well, they're naturally flat, so it's an ideal building site. In Boone, for example, um, the Boone Mall floods regularly, probably um, uh, definitely several times a year, the parking lot does. And uh, why then do we have that? Well, it's the only flat land around. Everywhere outside of Boone, if you look up in the hills, you know, it's a hilly, so you either have landslide-prone areas or flood-prone areas. 
so the building sites like campus is built in a floodplain right for the Boone Creek floodplains are also very fertile every time it floods there's an influx of raw mineral nutrients but also organic nutrients so it's very much a um, uh, like along the Mississippi because we have lots of crops there because it's very fertile floodplains are also waterways and the industry that develops adjacent to those waterways is really important to the economy we can move a lot of um, agricultural goods and manufactured goods along our waterways so then uh, commerce builds up along those corridors uh, people underestimate the risk and are ignorant of the risk or have a false sense of security based on the presence of levees or other engineer protective measures so we can do all we want to do to protect ourselves but water is strong and it's heavy have you ever tried to carry a five gallon bucket of water it's nearly impossible so um it, it, it's uh, difficult to live in the floodplain but we do it and we need to understand that it's definitely a risky thing to do flood frequency so fema the federal emergency management agency um, regulates um, or manages the emergencies of the United States of America and we use the hundred year flood plan to establish regulatory requirements so does the insurance industry so if you are buying a home adjacent to a stream they are going to charge you extra insurance if you're um, within that hundred year uh, flood plan the hundred year flood just means that there is a um, probability a 1% chance that within 100 years your home would be flooded so here is um, a cartoon of that so uh, here is the stream channel that first dotted line here is the two-year floodplain and there's a 50% probability that there will be a flood um, the floodplain so they so there's a, a good chance that every two years there's going to be a flood in the floodplain marked by those dashed lines the hundred year flood is the one that's higher up and that would be this home is in the hundred year floodplain this one's not a one percent probability that there will be a flood that year in the hundred year floodplain so here is an image um, from the 1993 flood of the mississippi river it was a big big flood that occurred in the middle of United States so in blue are areas covered by the hundred year flood and then in green on here are areas that were covered by the 500 year flood so the 500 year flood is um, these just these edges here all right in 1968 <clears throat> the United States put into place these FHA and VA mortgage loans that um, uh, put in definitions of what is a flood so a flood is a general and temporary condition of, of partial or complete inundation of two acres of normally dry land area or more than two properties at least one of which is your property these insurance programs were uh, are subsidized by the US government and uh, basically helps you out if you lose land or your home or your crops during a flood so these would be floods that are due to overflow of inland tidal waters so this could be in a hurricane situation with a storm surge or a high high tide unusual and rapid accumulation or, or runoff of surface waters from any source and mud flows which is just a really watery landslide all right flood frequency small floods happen every year while large widespread flood events are relatively infrequent so we have flooding events all the time in Boone it's made, it doesn't make, really make the news but the water leaves the channel pretty regularly bigger floods though um, are going to happen in Boone I it seems like once or twice a year we get a little flood event floods are random events which makes prediction impossible it's like predicting the weather the weather is pretty random what happened last year has no bearing on what happens this year and it doesn't predict what's going to happen next year so a flood can occur any time of year um, yeah if a long enough record of stream flow exists then 
probable flood frequencies can be estimated. Longer record equals greater accuracy. What that gives us is a knowledge of how big the floods are and how often a flood of that size occurs. So we look at lots of data and say, okay, there's a flood this size, it happens this often. And then we can get what's called a recurrence interval that says, okay, over the last hundred years, here's how often that big flood occurs. And we can graph it. So here's what a flood frequency curve looks like. This is the discharge, meaning how big is the flood. This one's in cubic feet per second. And then this is the recurrence interval of how often that occurs. So a flood, um, here's the 1994 flood that was 12,000 CFS. It's going to occur once every, oh, I don't know, 15 years, something like that. So this is for um, Fargo, North Dakota, the Red River. So the um, insurance companies and governments really use this data to govern um, um, policy with insurance. So if they'll give you insurance on land or how much your insurance is going to cost if you're prone in a flood zone. And also there are regulations like these homes here that are raised up because they are in the floodplain. So regulations and insurance issues. There's two kind of designations, the floodway district and the floodway district means this is an area that's probably going to flood more often. And so you wouldn't want to have a hard structure in it. So you could have things like farming, parking, parks, streets, soccer fields, that kind of thing in the floodway district, knowing that um, it's going to flood perhaps that year. The floodway fringe district would be the edge of that, so a little bit higher in the floodplain, and this would be the lowest structural level, two feet above the flood protection grade, meaning that we start putting houses on stilts. Flooding is something that occurs naturally, but urbanization can increase the magnitude and frequency of flooding. What I mean by urbanization is putting in impermeable surfaces. So covering large areas with um, parking lots, buildings, sidewalks, um, uh, yeah, anything where you have compacted ground or hard surfaces that the water, when it rains, can't hit that ground and infiltrate. So we take the hydrologic cycle and we skip the groundwater step and we go straight from precipitation to the stream channel, and the stream channel can't always handle all that water. So then we have um, a flood situation. Stormwater runoff from cities is distinctive. So it, it accumulates in a rainstorm, and then that stormwater often is um, coverted and sent straight to a river, and then we have a flooding event. So um, we have a shorter lag time between the rain flow, rainfall and the flood flow. That means that uh, when it precipitates, the, the, precip the rain precipitates, then it's going to hit the ground and go straight to the stream. Whereas in a non-urbanized setting, you would have the rain hit the ground, infiltrate, some time passes, and maybe some of it gets to the stream, and then you have a flood event. In this case, you're creating more of a flashy flood situation. This is on the left is before urbanization. So let's look at that. Both of the rainfalls are the same. So it's going to rain and then there's some lag time. That means the time between the max rain event and the max discharge, there's lag time. And it, there is going to be an increase in discharge because it rained. There's more water in the system in the watershed and then it's gone. In an after urbanization graph, the rainfall is the same, but look at the lag time. We've shortened it to uh, half of the lag time of the before urbanization graph, and the discharge is way higher. We've, we've exceeded flood stage, and then, af then um, the water goes away. So um, we've changed the hydrograph is what this is called over time. Okay. <clears throat> Here is a um, 
floodwaters and the sewer system for the floodwaters, just pumping water out. In some communities, that water is collected and dealt with by the municipality. It's like taken to the wastewater treatment facility. In some places, it's just let out in the streets. And so it's, you're taking water and putting it on an impermeable surface again. In this graph here, we have um, a flood frequency curve. This is the recurrence interval in years and discharge in cubic meters per second on the vertical. So an unurbanized setting is going to have um, lower discharges over a shorter amount of time, whereas um, a complete urbanization, you're going to have discharges increasing and um, having more flood events. Okay, here's two examples of that. These are hydrographs, and these are um, published by the USGS online at usgs.gov. On the um, x-axis here are dates. This is July 2012. And on the y-axis, this is discharge in cubic feet per second. So you can get these discharge graphs for any river that you want to. So on the bottom here is um, the Watauga River at Sugar Grove. And this line shows rain events. So it rained, it rained, it rained, it rained, it rained. So those are rain events showing it's kind of flashy, right? It rains and then goes away, it rains and then goes away. This bottom one is for the Cape Fear River where um, similar rain event, it rained and we have sustained uh, water over time and flooding. The distinction here is that these are upstream floods. An upstream flood means that um, we're in the headwaters. So the Watauga River is a headwater stream, and so it's localized flooding on a really small scale. You get a pulse of rain and then it goes away, a pulse of rain and then it goes away. The Cape Fear River is way um, downstream near the ocean. And so it's accumulating water in a much larger watershed. So we have on the order of 3,000 cubic feet per second of water versus 300 cubic feet per second of water. And that rainfall, because there's so much of it, is going to have a larger effect over a larger amount of time. Flash floods. Flash floods are really dangerous. Most fatalities in a flood event are going to occur because people are in their cars and try to drive through flood waters. One foot of water exerts 500 pounds of lateral force on a car. So it's very dangerous. That water can overwhelm you and um, push your car off the road and you can't get out and that's why they have the phrase turn around don't drown so most deaths are caused by flash floods click on this Houston flooding and check out some imagery of flooding in Houston what can we do well there's several ways that we can deal with floodwaters in urbanized settings so out in the wilds we don't really need to regulate floods, but we insist on living in these flood-prone areas. So one thing that happens, this, these are um, um, retention structures. So you can, instead of having the water just fill up the channel and flood your house, there can be a pond that sits um, pretty empty most of the year. And then when the floodwaters come, maybe it's a seasonal event, they would fill up that pond and then slowly let the water out over time. So a hydrograph for that would look like um, here's a, a flood prone area with no retention pond and then maybe with the retention pond let the water out slowly over time. Another is to put in artificial levees and we talked about pros and cons of that. So if this levee were to fail on, on the right side here, that house would get flooded. The house on the left is probably pretty safe because it's up on stilts. All right. Dams change the hydrology and trap sediment. So there are pros and cons to having a dam. They're going to trap sediment, which can starve beaches. So beaches need sediment to um, uh, not erode away. And so if you have a dam, it's going to hold back some of that sediment. They also change the hydrology. So a dam is going to make a lake that floods an area as well. 
dams create a new base level. So in this um, image here, we have a flood control dam. There's a new base level here. Here, the old profile is this dotted line here. The new profile, the stream has um, eroded further down into this valley. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers studied 8,639 dams in 1981 and determined that almost a third of those were unsafe. So there are a lot of unsafe dams. There's some privately, a lot of privately owned and small unsafe dams in the United States. Okay, so one other thing that is done is, is this term here, channelization. Let me move my face out of the way. I'm going to put it there channelization and channelization is um, taking a natural flowing stream and putting it in uh, a culvert or putting it in a concreted up stream like this and concreted up a man-made concrete channel in channelization often it involves clearing of debris those debris are habitats but debris i don't mean like um trash I mean like trees which are uh, usually habitats channelization makes streams deeper it makes them wider it makes them straighter when it's deeper wider and straighter it uh, gets faster so the velocity increases it's good for moving water through a system right we get the water out but where's that water gonna go it's gonna go downstream and cause more flooding downstream than upstream so that happens on campus right where the Boone Creek is channelized and culverted in many places, it's underground. And then when you get to Durham Park in the Boone Mall parking lot, you get flooding events because the upstream is so channelized. <coughs> it's bad for wildlife habitat. There's lots of channelized streams in the United States. The way a natural stream looks is this image here. It's kind of a cartoon, but uh, well, it is a cartoon. This is a riparian buffer zone. And it shows the vegetated corridor, and it shows the debris in the stream. So the stream bottom um, are <coughs> is populated by lots of aquatic organisms that need the nooks and crannies in these fallen trees to survive. Groundwater flows naturally into the system, and um, the riparian buffer zone provides shade to the stream for the um, temperature um the cold water species it provides habitat for the um for the bugs that feed the trout it provides hiding places for the deer that live in that area so it's riparian buffer zones are very good to have how to live with a flood so what is a smart thing to do is to monitor and to collect that data to create this flood frequency graphs where we're um, plotting that recurrence interval and the discharge continuous collection of data so we know the magnitude of flooding events having these retention structures so we can hold back some water and then slowly let it out over time also mapping out the floodplain if I showed you the image on the right a and I said draw the floodplain you probably could do a pretty good job of um, finding where the topography changes and that there's a flood zone and indeed if you go to the right here look at the 1993 Mississippi River flood it flooded the floodplain so those are the areas you don't want to have your buildings okay flash floods whoa excuse me flash floods are typical of which stream type headwater streams mature streams or both it's a the headwater streams how levees fail. So this is just a little look at failing levees. Flood waters rise so high that it overtops the levee. So this levee wasn't high enough and this water just went right over top of the levee. This is in 2011. Another way is through breaching where the water finds uh, some weakness and um, it's either pre-existing weakness, wear and tear, animal burrows, uprooted trees, or maybe there's a flood induced weakness so the flood waters beat against that levee and uh, with waves or slumping or piping piping 
would occur when um, the water it gets underneath it and comes out the other side. I think I have it. There we go, piping. So um, seepage here, you get a little bit of water coming through. A little bit of water leads to a lot of water. So suffusion is kind of just going through the grains, but then once any flow starts, then it can start moving those grains downstream, and then you have a um, pipe that is going to basically go through the levee. Seepage would be going underground and coming out the other side. There's going to be hydraulic head to it. There's going to be pressure behind it. So you would maybe have like a little sand boil or heaving. It would kind of rush out. So here is an area where um, on the river side, water is pushing against this levee. And it's coming up underneath it and kind of boiling out the other side. Let's go back. What was, yeah, here is an image. Whoa. Whoops. Oh my gosh. There we go stay. Here is um, piping. So the levee is holding. The water's not over top of it, but it's coming through the other side and causing this slumping. And then water's coming through. Bad. Water may be pushed through naturally uh, permeable layer, increases pore pressure and internal erosion. The hydraulic gradient increases and it's going to push that through. Impermeable aquifer sands. Impermeable not impermeable, impermeable aquifer sands overlying the riverbed levee, creating artesian conditions. Artesian conditions is because it's going to be under pressure. And then the sand boil is just boiling up water on the other side. In the Mississippi River in 1993, uh, it flooded and it was basically a ocean in the middle of um, the United States in 1993. There were um, flooding of uh, <clears throat> sustained rain up in the upper parts of the watershed. It was the wettest period. The precipitation from January through September 93 was the greatest amount, 44.4 inches in 121 years of record. The previous record was in 1881, about the same amount. It was the wettest 12 months prior to the flooding. And it was unusually persistent, like it kept raining. There wasn't much break in the precipitation. The soil moisture was really high, highest in history, and it was the cloudiest time in um, history of the northern part of that uh, top of the Mississippi watershed. And the <laughs> compounding it all, the evaporation was at its lowest. The flood then created um, insane flooding. So here's a these are um, stages. It's like discharge. We had a 100-foot stage flood and a 25-foot stage flood. The previous record was, um, um, you know, this line here, and we went way above that previous record. The um, one here, here's the previous record. So we matched the, pre the record here for the Mississippi River at Quad Cities and overtopped it in St. Louis. The flooding lasted a long time. So in the upper parts of the watershed, it was about 20 days. In the St. Louis area, over 30 days of flooding at record levels. The um, flooding occurred in stages. So you can see the dates here. July, July 9, July 10, July 13, July 17, July 20. Then we got to August, August 7th, August 7th, August 7th. So there was a month between the beginning of July and the beginning of August where they were um, timing the flooding and they knew when the flood crest was going to hit each town. So um, the flood crest were happening um, one after another down the Mississippi River. Near St. Louis, discharge rates uh, 1 billion CFS, six times the normal amount of water in the Mississippi River. General trend shows peaks arriving later and greater moving downstream the drainage network. So you have a really big watershed and the flood started in the upper parts of the watershed and they made their way down to the bottom of the watershed over the summer. River levels exceeded flood stage at 500 uh, National Weather Service river forecast points. So the National Weather, 
Weather Service hires hydrologists to predict flooding. And in 500 different locations, they had um, floods. 45 USGS stream gauges recorded flooding greater than the 100-year flood. At uh, time of the 1993 Great Flood, 251 Army Corps of Engineer levees are found in the upper Mississippi River Basin, 193 in the affected area. So there were lots and lots of levees. Where the stars are are places where the levees actually did their job and prevented flooding. Where the circles are, and those are these downstream locations, the levees um, met criteria but were overtopped. So they they didn't fail. And then the um, squares, there's not very many on like four squares, are places where the levee actually failed. <coughs> In the end result of all this flooding, there were 38 deaths from various um, uh, parts of the flooding, either from being overtaken in their cars or some people were um, swept from their yards or trying to do maintenance to prevent flooding. There were 12 to $16 billion in fiscal damages, so monetary damages, $6 billion for rescue and response. Most of the damage was for, from agriculture, so there was a lot of um, insurance claims, mostly related to agriculture. 70% of crop disaster assistance programs paid to counties in upland areas where ground saturation prevented planting or killing crops. So, so much of it, the money was um, given out for assistance. There were over 100,000 homes damaged, 50% suffered losses due to groundwater or sewer backup. Ew from overwhelming stormwater drains, not from river flooding. So there was backup in the system and it flooded people's homes. All right, <clears throat> this document here, it, the floodplains of the future, it just, I'm not gonna click on it, but you can, and it talks about like how to think about the floodplains in the future and to maybe not live in the floodplain. The end.